So hi, everybody. It's great to be here at this absolutely amazing event. Um, I wanted to give a special shout out to all my SAP colleagues. So I think they're hosting about 20 sub events around the world. So hi, SAP. Uh, <laughs> I actually wanted to start out by making a confession, which is I am not a data scientist. I actually have a degree in fine arts. And I was wondering at the, you know, last night, how do I explain to this audience how I started out in fine arts and somehow ended up as a COO for products and innovation at SAP? And then I had Diane Green, such an amazing leader, tell us that she started as a, a racing sailboats. So thank you, Diane, for showing us that uh, career progression is not always linear. So I'm sure, I mean, some of you may be aware of SAP's data analytics products as well as our SAP HANA in-memory database. But as I'm assuming that most of you um, haven't been shopping for enterprise applications recently, <laughs> I thought I'd just give you a very quick rundown. I mean, SAP essentially runs the core business processes of hundreds of thousands of businesses around the world. Um, but to put that into perspective, if we were to shut off all the SAP systems on the planet today, um, number one, you would probably never get home from this conference because your airplane would never take off. Um, even worse, your paycheck would never arrive in your bank account. But the absolutely most critical thing is that the world's production of chocolate would literally run to a halt. <laughs> so we're very important to the world. Um, Essentially, when you think of all of the global business transactions that happen in the world, it's estimated that 76% of them touch an SAP system. So the amazing thing about being at SAP is that you literally get a front row to what's going on in global business across all industries. So you may ask, what's the connection then between global business and data science, which is what I wanted to talk about today and start with this picture here. So some of you may know this picture. It's very famous, the blue marble. This was taken by the crew of the Apollo 17 when they were on their lunar mission in 1972. It's actually the last picture of Earth ever taken by a human. We've never been that far away from the planet again to take such a photo. It shows the Earth, obviously, as an object of extreme beauty, but also in its incredible fragility. Um, and at the time, if you think back to 1972, I mean, many of us in the room weren't even born, and the world was a very different place. The population was about 3.8 billion. The price of oil was around $3.50 a barrel. And what's really interesting for you in the room is that the guidance system that they used for the Apollo mission had only 32 kilobytes of, uh, of storage. And we did some, some digging around in SAP, and we found out that that is half what's in a singing birthday card today. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't about the data. It was about the science. So if we compare that to the world today, many, as many of you know, our population has almost doubled since 1972. We're a population of 7 billion and rapidly growing. The last time I checked the price of oil, I'm not on the market but <laughs> for oil, but it was around $50 a barrel. And I don't need to tell anybody in this room that obviously the volumes of data are massively exploding. But what's more interesting to us at SAP and what we see from working with all of the businesses that we do, it's this combination of the massive acceleration of technologies like robotics, like biotechnology and nanotechnology and machine learning that are creating this fusion between the physical world the biological world and the digital world, and really blurring the lines. And this is often now called the fourth industrial revolution. This revolution is bringing with it some significant challenges that we hear about from all of the CEOs we work with. We talked already about job displacement, so what will happen with the rise of artificial intelligence to jobs. There's the obvious gap that it's starting to create between the technology halves and the many people who are still technology have-nots. We are incredibly privileged um, to be here in this audience, in this room. Um, and it's also highlighting the, let's say, inefficiency we have in our supply chain around resources with the growing population that we have. If we continue to advance the way we do, there's absolutely no way that our delicate planet will be able to support our future. 
But it also brings with it incredible opportunities. And if we do this right, and we can navigate through this digital revolution in the right way, we have incredible opportunities to change the world. And I can say from the business leaders that we work with, and if for anybody who recently watched the replays from the World Economic Forum in Davos, business is not sitting still. So business leaders absolutely understand that they have a key role to play. Uh, many of them have made strong commitments to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, like SAP. But at the same time, my observation is that business is really at a tipping point. So you have problems and challenges in business and in the world that are of a magnitude of complexity and speed like business leaders have never, ever seen before. So what worked in the past when it comes to directing the future of industry and business is not going to work in the future. And if you think about the way you imagine a traditional boardroom, you imagine these data printouts that come in, right? So you have your pie charts and your Excel sheets and they're prepared and they're printed and the executives go through them and they look at them. But at the end of the day, most decisions are still made based on their gut instinct, right? Their ex past experience and the experience of the people around them. But what CEOs are telling us today is that doesn't work anymore, right? The challenges are just too big. So I would say that when it comes to business, data is not the problem. We have lots of data. We have too much data. The data is exploding. What we need is to take the data and apply the creative curiosity and the systematic discipline of science. So when I think about data science, it's not about the data, it's about the science. And this is a change for business. If you ask most CEOs about data, they can talk a lot. If you ask them what role does the application of science play in your business, you will probably get a lot of blank stares. Right. So this is why I think the work of data science is so important, because it's literally going to change the way that business leaders look at problems. And this is why all of you are so important to us today. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples. I'm not sure if we have any New Yorkers in the audience. I know Eliza's here. <laughs> and I know that we have a contingency from New York uh, also watching online. But I live in New York. I've lived there for three years. And I have the absolute pleasure of taking the subway to work every morning. Um, this adds a certain, shall I say, element of unpredictability to my morning. <laughs> right? You're never quite sure. You never want to hear the message, we are delayed due to train traffic ahead of us. That's every New Yorker's favorite message. So I was very interested to hear about a project that SAP is doing with an Italian train company, Train Italia. So Train Italia is the biggest uh, operator of trains in Italy. They move about 2 million people per day. But even more interestingly, they move about 80 million tons of freight per year. So just keeping the trains running is a huge problem for them. If we think about how it was done in the past, something would break, there'd be a train operator, they would call a dispatcher, they'd send out a, true uh, a crew to fix the train. It was very reactive and very inefficient. And today, of course, we have sensors on the train and we can do some data analysis, but there's still a heck of a lot of human intervention in the process. So where SAP and Train Italia are joining is to try to move this into a completely predictive and automated process so that you can take the IT data from our systems around maintenance combine that with the OT data from the sensors, bring in the sophistication of the science, codify all the rules around what the engineers know, move that into predictive models and make this much more highly efficient. So you think naturally about how much safer and efficient this can make train travel for Train Italia, but I think about what will happen when all of you apply those systems to transport systems around the globe, and I think Yes, it's important for the people, but you also think about the tons of freight and how much resource is lost and how much food is spoiled simply because our customers are not able to move it from point A to point B. It's a massive problem. 
To give you another example, moving into biology, I learned that there's an estimated between 10 million to 100 million species on Earth. But only 1.7 million of them have actually been identified. And this is largely because, of course, we t needed highly trained experts who would physically examine all the samples and catalog everything in quite a manual and analog process. Um, somebody told me they estimate that it would take 10,000 taxonomists 600 years to identify 10 million species. So obviously we need to change. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the Barcode of Life project. So this is an absolutely in, um, phenomenal international project where they've literally identified a small DNA sequence they call the Barcode of Life, um, which can uniquely identify species. And they have the very ambitious project to create a database of all species in the world. So SAP collaborated with them on our data platform, but also to, on this mobile application where they're starting to open up the data set to the citizen scientist. So any of you who loved biology and would like access to the data, you can download the um, life scanner. Um, but what it allows people to do is not only explore the data, but also to um, contribute their own samples. But now that we have the data, what we need is the science. And when you think about the exciting applications of having a data set where we have um, all of the species cataloged, it, uh, the applications are phenomenal. I mean, from the business side, you look at something like food fraud, which is a huge problem in our supply chain and also a huge health issue um, for consumers. But you also look at the protection of endangered species, um, trying to track the invasion of species, like the Asian tiger mosquito, um, as well as trying to um, tackle things like poaching um, and other issues. So now that the data is there, it's open for all of you, and I would invite you, if you're interested, um, to contact me and get involved in the project. To give you a last example, when business leaders are looking at these challenges of the fourth industrial revolution, you talk to any CEO, they will tell you, I need the best people, I'm in a war for talent, but I also need to diversify my workforce. For CEOs, this is an obvious thing. They know um, that we need more perspectives to, to um, how do you say, bring new ideas into these challenges. So companies like SAP are absolutely committed to trying to eliminate bias throughout the workforce processes. But I can tell you from my experience in the office of the CEO, it is incredibly difficult to take a great idea that your leaders have and that people buy into and actually codify that in operational processes within your business. So we've started to work on a project called Business Beyond Bias, where we ch we're trying to use machine learning to, how do you say, um, um, to uh, eliminate bias automatically through the system all along the HR process. So this can be everything from resume screening with recruiters to salary and compensation to promotions. So this is a close collaboration that we're doing with our customers to try to eliminate bias through the HR systems. So in closing, I would ask, um, why do we need more women in data science? And I think you heard some great answers this morning, and there's many perspectives. But when I look about at it from a big picture, I would say we've seen three industrial revolutions come and go. And while women have played a very important role in many of these revolutions, undoubtedly they've been shaped by men. We are now in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. And the choices that we make right now will really change the future of our planet. We need as many diverse um, ideas, experiences, and perspectives to make sure this moves in the right direction. And that's why I'm very passionate about this cause and we absolutely need all of you. Thank you very much. I wanted to, uh, you mentioned tipping point and I agree. Yeah. We're at a point where data models are well beyond where companies are comfortable implementing those ideas. So yes. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that, about taking science experiment to scalable business process, what are some success factors or some examples where uh, you go from 
ready-made mature model to mm -hmm. uh, business value. Right. Um, so I think what I see in SAP and with our customers is where the CEO is going to reach a realization that the problem is just too complicated for their executive team to tackle on their own. Um, it's when the problems are very interdisciplinary um, and also, to be honest, the speed of competition. This has amazing impact on how quickly your data models will be used. So I think you'll start to see that, I mean, we had net Netflix in the room. As soon as they see their competitors also starting to adopt um, these data models and really adopt data science, the interest will quickly grow. Um, and most CEOs are realizing that um, if they don't quickly get in the game, um, they will be left behind. So I would say at the moment it has to do a lot with the leadership and the competitive positioning. Hey, we have a Twitter question. Um, we have a question from WIDS Calgary. Um, they're asking about if someone's new to data science and wants to explore the field, where would you suggest they get started? Do they need to go for another degree or some sort of training, or how did you sort of get into data science from outside? Well, of course they should get a degree in fine arts. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would give a shout out to U of C. I'm actually from University of Alberta. So hello, Calgary. Um, so like I said, I'm not a data scientist, and, um, but I think what I do find fascinating is this discussion around domain expertise. I think, don't think about it too narrowly. I mean, if you start with a degree in a specific domain and then can augment that with data science, you're going to have a leg up over someone who just does the math side of it. So anything you can do to also bring, to be honest, some business know-how so that you actually understand how a business would apply what you do, as well as some domain expertise together with the math, to me, those are going to be the people who are the most employable or at least the most interesting on an executive level. We have uh, time for one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, um, I would like you to speak more, a bit more about how you work with HR to remove biases in the HR processes. Because a lot of people assume that data is inherently neutral, but that's not true. And in fact, there's a danger of further entrenching or encoding biases uh, through data science. So how do you educate people when you work with people who are not very conscious about what data science does. Right. Um, so we've had incredible reception from our HR team and from our recruiters um, themselves. So I think you have to go to the end user and involve them in the process and explain to them what you're doing and also include them in the design of the system. Because if you just develop some features, throw it over the fence to the recruiters and say, here you are, we've now fixed it for you and made it better, you won't necessarily see it take off. So I think one of the keys is when you're designing these features into applications, you need to involve the people who are going to use it at the end. So in the case of HR, you need the HR business partners, you need the recruiters, um, you need everyone who's involved in the process to help you design in the features. Um, it's not just about the math, it's also about the end user. And that's where they've been quite successful, I know, in the SAP SuccessFactors product. Great. Well, wonderful place yeah. to, to stop. Thanks so much again Thank for coming. Thank you, Margo. And yeah. 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 Fantastic talk. Really, yeah. really great. Yeah.